I'll, I'll pray before we start. Lord, we just thank you for this beautiful day that we've had. Lord, I pray that um, it will be your words speaking through me and not me. We thank you for um, Jesse's words about your promises and what you say about us. We just give the service into your hands in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So anyway, no slides? Yeah, look, I've got slides. I came prepared. So I'm going to talk about... Oh, sorry, that wasn't a dig at you, (laughs) Jesse. You did awesome. Okay, surrendering all. So I chose this topic because I was very convicted about surrendering all. And I wanted to break down what that means, what that looks like what that looks like in a practical sense and how we can apply it. And there's a lot of levels to surrendering all and it's a big topic. Um, the scriptures that will tie into this is Romans 8:28, And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And Romans 8:31, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, amen. Just for research purposes, Please raise your hand if you have your wallet on you or some jewellery, your keys, prized possessions. Right, now, how would you feel if I asked you to give that up? Can I please have it? I have a basket here and I bring that all to me. Surrender it all. Give it up. No? No, no, no thank you. Yeah, didn't think so. So I guess that's what you can think of when we think surrendering all. When it comes to our relationship with Jesus, having to ask God, what is okay, what is not? You know, what about the pain when he says no? How do we deal with that? What goes on? Are we going to miss out on life for the youths? You know, what does that mean? Does that mean we get to miss out on the fun years of teen life? And they're all valid questions, but surrendering is actually more beautiful than it sounds. So to begin, I've got definitions. Yeah. Next slide. So those of you who know me, I'm studying to be a teacher. So this is the teacher and me coming out. I've got definitions. So to surrender, the Greek Hebrew definition is paradid omi. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it means to yield up, to entrust, submission, or to commit. And then to entrust means to place something um, in someone else's possession or care. And then submission also, I looked at the Greek and Greek Hebrew definition is hypotesol. Yes, hypotesol. It's to get under and lift up. So this one means to arrange oneself under the command of the divine viewpoint rather than our own human perspectives. Because how many times have we attempted and failed at understanding everything that happens in our life when, you know, things go wrong. It's because we're looking from our own own human eyes rather than God's divine point of view. He knows what he's doing and that's why we know our hope is anchored in Christ. So today I'm going to take you through one example, one non-example, um, how and why we should surrender. So first up, one non one example. Next slide. Yeah, look, I've got another form of visual for you. So this is the story. Good old Peter, you know, Jesus is preaching to the crowd, saw two boats, and the fishermen were washing their nets. And then Jesus got into Simon Peter's boat, and he said, you know, go on, go on. And then Jesus stops, and he says, launch your nets into the deep if you want to find them fishies, you know. And Peter goes, politely, we've been doing this all night, but... At your word, I will let down your net. And what happens? Fishies, a lot of them. So many fishies that this net breaks. So Peter fell at Jesus' knees and said, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. And Jesus says, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. And then verse 11 is the highlight. It says, So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. So forsook just means is a past tense for forsake. So they abandoned everything and left everything. No ifs, no, oh, hold on, I just need I just need to pack my bags and then I'll be on my way. At that moment, they left everything, they dropped everything to follow Jesus. Now we'll look at to um Next one. And then we'll look at a non-example. So just some background. This is from Luke 9, verse 59. Some background info is that in Luke 9, all sorts of things happen. 
Jesus sends out his 12 disciples to preach and heal. Um, and then the feeding of the 5,000 and lots of other good stuff happen. Now, as Jesus continued his, his journey in verse 57, someone said to him, Jesus, I will follow you. And he responded in verse 58. He didn't say no, but Jesus didn't sugarcoat it either. Um, the motive and the nature of Jesus' mission kept him on the move, which means his followers would be too. Okay, so we made it to verse 59. It says, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. Hmm. Now, I'm not going to go into depth with what it means when Jesus said, let the dead bury their own dead, but I will direct you to Tim Keller's podcast, um, who, which is um, revolved around what this scripture means and breaks it down. But I don't know about you guys, if we look at that verse again, it says, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus says, nah, let the dead bury their own dead. And at first glance, you think, well, that's, not, that's not like Jesus. What does that really mean? And so to me, that didn't align with Jesus's character or who I know, what I know of Jesus. So I looked into it. And in the, those days, the Jewish tradition is that if somebody dies, the body is not left alone until after the burial. So making makes more sense now why? Because Jesus knew that obviously this person hasn't died then. So what this guy really meant was, let me remain in my father's house and care for him until he dies. And then if you read on to read on, the verses, there's more examples of, um, yes, Jesus, I'll follow you, but just one second. So I just wanted to, you to take a moment to reflect. How many times has Jesus called us, but we've had conditions? Yes, Lord, I'll follow you, but I'm in high school and all my friends just want to go to parties. Let me let me have fun and then, and then I'll follow you, promise, as soon as I can. I'll be right there. Or... Yes, Lord, I follow you, but there's this huge opportunity at work that requires just all my time and all my effort. But as soon as I get that promotion, I will be with you ASAP. Promise, promise, I'll be there. And so we make excuses. Um, Tim, a quote by Tim Keller says, if you have any conditions, you are your own king because you place yourself in a position to say yes or no to Jesus, depending on whether you think it is practical to obey. So just sit with that for a moment because I was pretty convicted about that. Now my message has started. <laughs> Let's get into some practical ways that we can apply surrendering all and what that actually looks like. So firstly, how? It means accepting Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. That would be the first step to committing our lives to Him and giving our all, giving our lives. Secondly, what I like to do is start, dedicate the start of my day to Him. I've been doing this for about a year now, just over a year. No matter how I feel, no matter what happens in the morning, as soon as my alarm goes off, I say, thank you, Lord, for this day. Give this day into your hands. Pray goes according to your will. And I pray that your light shines through me. Those exact words every morning. And I started making a habit. And I promise you when you start doing that, when you dedicate your day to the Lord, you'll notice a huge difference. Everything will just fall into place. Number three, giving up control on situations that you cannot control. As humans, we like to spiral. We like to overthink. We like to take hold of our own situations even though we know there's aspects that we cannot. So if there is a difficult situation, it's not yours anymore. Give it to God. First Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your burdens, all your anxieties, all your cares unto Jesus because he cares for you. And so that looks like doing what you can and then letting go, letting God do the rest. And sometimes you may not believe it, you might not feel it, but you got to try it. And when, yes, you got to trust it, you got to try it. Just start giving all the little things into his hands and you will notice the difference. So a prayer for me, a little when I'm driving can look like, Lord, help me, please. 
please. I can't do this myself and I'm not going to try either. Please take the situation and whatever happens, I thank you. Even when I might think that's not the best outcome, I know you see the things I don't. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think it's funny. Um, when we pray for things, we often get surprised when Jesus actually does it. <laughs> Matthew 7, 7, you know, it says, ask and you shall receive. And so why do we get so surprised? Because it may not look like the answer prayer we hoped for, but he still, he still answered our prayers. So I, I just thought it was pretty funny because when he does it, then we're all like, oh, Jesus did that for me. But we should thank him because he promised us that he will. And then the last point is spending time in prayer and the word. So, <clears throat> excuse me, surrendering is committing and understanding not just what he does, but who he is. And that will assist us in our desire to have a closer relationship and continue to give everything to him and grow. And I've also read in here just a little pointer. Sometimes it can mean that we did surrender and we took the first step and now we're waiting. We're waiting on the Lord. A few years ago when someone would say, I'm just waiting on the Lord. I'm like, what, do you, what does that look like? Are you sitting down? Are you waiting for a call from him? Is some wind tornado going to happen in your room and he's going to appear? What does that really look like? And I actually think my dad preached on this about two years ago when we were doing diggers rest from our home. The illustration is going to restaurants and there's a waiter and waitresses and they're coming around and what are they doing? They're serving. They're serving. So similarly, when we are waiting on the Lord, we're still serving him. When we are waiting for an answer, we're praying, we're fasting, we're sharing his word, we're spending time with him, and we are considering him in everything we do. When I wrote that point down, I, I was like, hmm, I like that one. Consider him in everything you do. That means when you wake up, thank you, Jesus. When I'm driving, thank you, Lord, keep me safe, please, because these drivers on the road, nah, not, not it. Anyway, and when you're on the train, when you're going to work, you know, Lord, be with me, please. I pray that in all situations that you will take over. So considering him in every little thing that you do. So it's also accepting that God's got our back. It's total and full commitment to him, which isn't scary because scripture promises us. So in Romans 8, 28, the scriptures I mentioned first, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to a purpose, to his purpose. So it's those who love him, those who have a relationship with him. And not just some things, all things, all things. And if God is for us, who can be against us? And then when everything seems like it is against us, remember that surrendering, is focusing on God's divine viewpoint and understanding that our human perspectives can fail us and his plans are greater. Jeremiah 29, 11, beautiful verse, one of my favorites, of course, says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper and not to harm, plans to give you a hope and future. And this links in with my whys. Why should we surrender to God? Why should we go through this process of surrendering to God? Why not? No, kidding, kidding. I've got, re I've got real explanations for you. So when we accept Jesus, sorry, next slide. When we accept Jesus, there's an inwards transformation that happens. So the more areas of our life we surrender, the more we make room there is the more we make room, there is filling for the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, we exhibit traits of his character. As most of us know, Galatians 5, 22 to 23. Um, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. As you get to know him more, as you come into a relationship with him, as you draw closer, all these qualities shine through you and you will really, really see it in your life. Um, one example I give you, again, when I'm driving, it really takes Jesus' love and patience to not road rage. In the mornings, 
I'm just trying to abide by the speed limit, but these people cannot. So it actually, and it can be dangerous sometimes too, but you always put yourself in their shoes, okay? What if they're driving really slow? What if they're in a lot of pain? I know my back was in a lot of pain on Friday and I had to leave work early and I wasn't driving how I would normally. And I was just thinking, what if someone else was going through that pain while they're driving, but they still had to get to work? Or if they're speeding, what if there's an emergency? Just what if? And that would make you more understanding, more self-control, more patience, more love, more peace for the people around you. So they are all good qualities. And also he is good and he is Lord. So I always say we are very blessed to know Jesus and to be so loved, to have unexplainable peace and joy. Because when you experience him, why wouldn't you want to give everything to him? When you really surrender to him and see the way that he uses you, why wouldn't you want to just totally commit and give your life into his hands? Because it's God's divine viewpoint. Uh, it's it's him. I He sees everything and he knows the best for me. So why wouldn't I give everything I have unto him? And so to finish off, I'll read the last scripture of Galatians 2 verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave his self up for me. So I'd like to close by saying when everything else fails, when everything is falling apart and we struggle to surrender all aspects or different aspects of our life, whatever it may be, meditate on his love. His love being so great for us that he died on the cross. He loves you and he cares. And like we saw in that drama as well, he is always waiting for you. No matter what pushes us aside, no matter what drags us away, he's still there and he's waiting for you. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and I'll read this last scripture and the band will come up. Psalm 63 verse 3. Because your loving kindness is better than life, my lips shall praise you. Amen. Lord Jesus, we just thank you for this time that we have had. Lord, I pray that we all will grow in a closer relationship with you and have a desire to hunger and thirst for you more and just to know who you are and what you have done for us, Lord. We thank you for your promises in our lives, Lord. We just give the rest of this day into your hands. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen.